Good afternoon, I'm Denise Melton and I'm uh, co-chair to the Cross Ministry Committee on FASD and so I welcome everyone this afternoon um, to our first education session on engaging students affected by FASD with Dr. Jackie Pye and Marjorie Carter. Uh, working with children and youth impacted with FASD in the schools can be very rewarding and at times very challenging and so we're very excited to commence this series on education and working with children and youth with FASD. Just a little bit of background, education and training are critical components of the 10-year strategic plan on FASD, which is actually being published or printed currently, and so that will be out in press very soon to you. Um, and it's also a great opportunity to share best practices and uh, sort out what kind of supports individuals with uh, FASD need in the school system. So our pre presenters today will share their challenges faced by a child or youth in the school environment and focus on various strategies for success for that child or youth. So I'd now like to introduce uh, our two presenters, Dr. Jackie Pye. Um, Jackie began her career in uh, mental health as a forensic counselor many years ago with young offenders. She then decided to return to school to do a PhD in ed psych. Her focus of study has been in the area of memory impairment and FASD. She's also now in private practice specializing in neuropsych assessments and also works with the Diagnostic FAS team at the Glenrose and teaches at the University of Alberta in Ed Psych. She also volunteers at the Edmonton Support Network walk-in clinic. Um, along with Jackie, uh, we're pleased to have Marjorie Carter who's doing a later presentation as well. Um, and Marjorie joins us with 29 years of experience teaching primarily in Aboriginal communities in rural Alberta. She's a graduate from the University of British Columbia where she specialized in studying, uh, studying adolescent issues, particularly in the area of FASD. She's employed as a teacher and administrator in the Edmonton Public School Boards currently and uh, works with all kinds of youth at risk and helps teachers understand programming and uh, opportunities for these students. In addition, she and her husband have four adopted children, all of whom have FASD. Very exciting to have these two uh, accomplished women with us today, and so I welcome both of them. Thanks, Denise. Um, hi, and thanks again for everyone for coming. I think this is great that we can have this kind of uh, a learning series and an opportunity to ask some questions and, and explore some, some options anyway. I won't say provide solutions because I don't think we're at a solution place, but I do think we're in a process of discussing some <coughs> strategies and, and approaches that are effective for this population. You're going to have to forgive me. I'm sorry. I've got a bit of a cold today, as does Marjorie. So the two of us might go occasionally hoarse on you. Um, we are going to do our best not to, but bear with us. Um, and, and also, you know, Marjorie and I have just sort of teamed up to do this. Um, as you've heard, I'm a psychologist. And so I work a lot with school age kids. I do a lot of work in terms of assessment and trying to best understand children. I work with teachers in terms of trying to figure out what's the best solution for a child in a given setting. But I'm not a teacher. And so for me to go to teachers and tell teachers how to work in your classroom, I feel like it's not always the best fit. And so Marjorie and I here have had um, the good fortune of working together uh, a few times or in different ways. And so she was kind enough to say, I'll come with you, Jackie, and we'll do this. And I'll have a little bit of teacher's perspective to lend to this and add to our discussion today. And so that's sort of how we are. So we're sort of kind of going to work as we usually do, which means kind of flying by the seat of our pants and discussing some of these issues as it's going to be relevant to you in the classroom. Also, you'll notice on the board behind me that I keep walking in front of. Uh, both Marjorie and I have put our email addresses <coughs> up here. If you can't see them on the sites, I'm not sure how well you guys can see this board. Um, I'll read them out for you at the end. It's just an opportunity if you guys at some point you hear something today and you don't have a chance to ask a question and you'd like to ask us a question or, or follow up on something, um, you can contact us and, and follow up on it. Okay, so. I mean, we're going to sort of spend an hour and a half talking about this stuff today, but this is an awful lot of stuff to do in an hour and a half, and so we're just going to touch on some highlights. Um, but this is an opportunity for us to follow up as we need to. Um, another kind of general note, um, you know, I'm not sure of all your specific backgrounds. I know we have some people from specialized schools or programs, and I suspect there's people from a lot of different grades and levels of education. So a lot of what we're talking about today will be a little bit more general. Occasionally, I'll specifically refer to age levels or things like that, but we're going to kind of, it'll be a bit more generalized, although I invite questions that might be a little bit more specialized to your setting. But it's difficult, obviously, with so many different school settings and so many different opportunities for children 
for us to sort of gear a presentation towards one of those at, at this point. So we've kind of gone for a little bit more general and hopefully hitting on some themes that will really um, give you guys something to work from. We're really talking about sort of giving ourselves a solid foundation to really do some troubleshooting and planning for success for the children that we're working with. So in your first slide you'll see it just gives you a little definition of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Bottom line, what are we talking about when we use the term FASD, uh, which is the, the so the title that I'll kind of probably refer to the most. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is physical, mental, behavioral, and or, meaning it doesn't have to be all these, and or learning disabilities. Okay, these are these things that may, child may experience or an individual somebody may be dealing with due to prenatal alcohol exposure. All right, so those are sort of the fundamental pieces. When we're talking about FASD, one of the must-be pieces, and I'm not going to go into a long lecture on what FASD is per se, but just so that we all know what we're talking about, is a child that has been exposed to alcohol in utero, and that that alcohol has affected the way their brain has developed. So their brain, at a very basic level, is different. It's functioning different than a brain that has not been exposed to alcohol. When we work with this population, we need to know that that's what we're starting from. This, unit, this is a child who has strengths and difficulties and, and, and a lot of these things we're going to talk about today, but we are starting with a child who has a unique brain for this reason. And so that's sort of the one thing I wanted to start with. How are children with FASD different from other children? Why are we pulling out this population and talking about them? Why are we focusing on this as opposed to not just saying, let's talk about good special ed for kids, or let's talk about special needs for kids. What do we need to do? Why do we pick this population? And why are there so many people out saying, I want to know more about this. I want to talk about this. On to your next slide. One of the big things or the unique pieces um, that consistently comes with FASD is that we're dealing often with a cluster of problems. It's not a single problem. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is not a single thing. It is not a single issue. It is not a child with a learning disability and that's all. It is a cluster of problems. These are children who come with maybe attention problems, maybe learning problems, maybe intellectual difficulties, maybe behavioral problems, maybe problems in sort of their higher level skills, Maybe some of those, maybe most of those, maybe all of those, anything. There's a lot of variations and we're going to talk about that today. But when we're talking about this population, they are going to have a cluster of problems. That creates challenges for you in the classroom because there are more than one, there's more than one issue that you're faced with. There's more than one thing that you're looking for ways to respond to. Okay, on to the next one. As I've already said, or the next point on that slide, I say often both organic and environmental factors contribute. So when we talk about FASD, we talk about sometimes primary disabilities and secondary disabilities. That's sort of the words, the terminology we use. Primary disabilities are those things that that child is experiencing because of that brain that is de uniquely developed that I talked about earlier. Okay, sometimes you'll hear terms like brain damage, brain dysfunction, impairment. You're going to hear a lot of terminology. Ultimately, we're talking about a brain that is different because of alcohol exposure. That is your primary disability. That is the brain, the foundation that you are working with. Secondary disabilities. Now, secondary disabilities is another thing that makes FASD really unique because we see F these secondary disabilities. These are disabilities that come along when in environmental factors contribute to what the difficulties are. I sometimes think about it as if there's not a good fit between that child and their unique brain and their environment, the setting that is around them, the context that is around them, we see secondary disabilities. We see things like kids who are really frustrated and unhappy in school. We see dropout rate, we see criminal behavior, we see them aligning themselves with really marginalized populations and thereby getting into a lot of trouble. Um, we see a lot of these additional secondary problems when the environment is not supporting that unique child. All right, I'm not going to get into, there's other things we can talk about when we talk about environment. 
um, regarding what home looks like or things like that. I'm not going to go there. Obviously, we're talking about school setting. The good news about these secondary disabilities is that we can do things in terms of environment, in terms of support, <coughs> in terms of the way we respond to children with FASD. We can do things that change those outcomes. Children with FASD can have great success. Children with FASD can go on to have good lives and, and can go places and do things. This is not a diagnosis and this is not a population that is an endpoint for these kids. It just means we need to understand these children and create environments for these children and support these children in such a way that facilitates success for them. Now, finding what that fit is going to be and how we're going to do that for an individual child, that's why you're here and that's what we want to discuss because that is the real challenge. It's not an easy thing to do. I can sound very Pollyanna about it and say we're going to make it all beautiful, but it's a challenge and you guys are dealing with really hard thing in your day-to-day -day work with these children. But these are neat kids. Anyone that's worked with somebody with FASD, these are great kids. They're fun kids to work with. And you know what? They have potential and they have skills. And there's a lot of really good things and that's something I don't want us to forget today as we keep talking. All right, we're flipping on to our next slide. The challenge of FASD, okay? So the challenge, we're going to keep talking about, you know, what makes this a challenging population. Another piece of it that is challenging, so we've got the cluster, we've got this kind of coming together of, of brain difficulties and a difficulty making the environment a good fit. Those are two things that are really challenging about FASD. What else? Well, you know what? The difficulties aren't always consistent or predictable. These are kids that aren't always the same two days in a row. And wow, that's hard because you think you've got to know and get to know a kid and then boom, the next day you're like, wow, <laughs> that worked yesterday. Yesterday it was brilliant. Today, not so much. That's really challenging to work with. Now, the difficulty with that is, again, let's go back to the brain really briefly. I won't spend tons of time on the brain today. But when we're dealing with the kind of brain injury that we are, as a result of alcohol exposure, it affects the brain in a lot of different ways. The brain kind of talks to itself using electrical circuitry, in part. Okay, It's a little electrical connections. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had a light or some kind of fixture in your house where you turn it on and it goes bzz, bzz, and the light flashes and it goes on and it goes off and you kind of whap it a few times and it stays on for a while and it goes off. Has anyone ever had kind of fixtures? Yeah, yeah, I sure have. And you know, sometimes it's working and sometimes it isn't, depending on how that wiring is connected. Our brains have some similar things going on. And so there is days when that wiring and when that circuitry is working well or connecting well and there are days I don't know what we know what the differences are. There could be a lot of factors. There are a lot of factors that contribute to the day-to-day -day differences. But we are truly dealing with brains that function differently from day to day. And so some of this is still we're dealing with a brain that is unique and different. Not a child who cares one day and doesn't care the next day. These are not children who have come to school one day and said, I'm going to mess with you. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, maybe they are sometimes. But <laughs> yes, they are sometimes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm not going to give them that much credit. These kids like to mess with us sometimes. However, it's more complicated than that. This is not willful children who are always out there to torture us. There are days when truly they will get something. They will understand that math problem that one day. <coughs> they will know how to do it. And you will be saying, yes, yes, we've worked so hard and they've got it. They've got this math problem. And the next day you say, okay, come on, Johnny, let's do it again. And Johnny's like, uh, and he's doing it all wrong. And you're like, oh, uh, and you're frustrated. Of course you are. But it could well be, this is not just Johnny not caring. This could be that there's problems within Johnny's memory or a lot of different systems. But again, it's a child who's truly going to lose things sometimes and who's sometimes going to be inconsistent and sometimes what he's learned is going to be gone and then you know what you may come back on Wednesday so Monday he's got it Tuesday it's gone Wednesday you're kind of going yeah whatever here Johnny do the problem and he does it and you're like okay I don't get it this is frustrating that can happen and that's a possibility as a result performance may shift from day to day things may look different from day to day and that can be based on what's going on for that child Another thing, FASD, 
The diagnosis, so a child who comes with a diagnosis of FASD, and there are many diagnoses under that umbrella term. A child could have a diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome or fetal alcohol effect is something we've said in the past. Um, there's complicated diagnosis like alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, big mouthfuls we like to use to sound really technical about things. There's a lot of different diagnoses. Regardless of the diagnosis, whether it's FASD, FAE, FAS, some other alphabet soup diagnosis, when it's an FASD-related diagnosis, that title does not tell you about function. That diagnosis does not tell you what you can expect from that child. There are diagnoses out there that when you see it, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, if you hear a child has that, you can kind of expect certain things. You kind of think, okay, I'm probably going to see a child who's moving in their seat. And these, there's certain expectations that you guys will make, or I will make, based on hearing that diagnosis. It's going to look a little different in different kids, but there's some themes that you'll expect. FASD. Two children with FASD can look entirely different. And I'm sure you guys can tell me that too, because you've probably seen it in your classroom. Um, Sam and Chris. I put down Sam and Chris. There's no such thing as a real, well, I mean, there are Sams and Chris's out there, but I just made Sam and Chris up for us today. But Sam, let's say hypothetically, Sam is a young man with FASD, and Sam comes into school in the morning, he sits down at his desk, and he's moving in his seat, and he's going in his seat, and he's up out of his seat, and he's over talking to his friends, and you're like, Sam, please sit down. And Sam sits down, and he's up again, and he's moving again. And then you go, Sam, please sit down. And Sam says, I don't want to sit down, and he's throwing things around the classroom, and he's moving. Next thing you know, he's down in the office. That's a day with Sam. Anyone ever seen a Sam? Anyone work with a Sam? <laughs> yeah, a few people. Yeah, Sam's there. Okay, that's Sam. Then maybe we have Chris. Chris comes to school in the morning, and she, he, doesn't matter which, Sam could be he, she, same deal. Chris comes to school, sits down, don't even hear a word, not a peep, just sits there. <coughs> Hands in work, it's not always complete, it's not always easy to read, not passing a lot of things, not seeming to understand things but shows up, comes there, recess goes out, kind of isolated, doesn't play with a lot of kids, but pretty quiet, doesn't get in a whole lot of trouble, just sort of disappears if you kind of let it go. You say, oh, this child's FASD, and they go, really? I never noticed. They just seem to have some problems with learning. That child's FASD too, potentially. And so those are two kids that could look really different. And, and maybe you've seen a Sam, and maybe you've seen a Chris <coughs> in your class. And I mean, I could keep going through a bunch of names, and we could come up with a lot of different examples, and I think you guys have seen them. FASD is not a topology. It's not like a, here's the picture of a child with FASD. That creates additional challenges for you because you could have two, three, or I don't know how many kids you might have in your classroom or in your program with FASD, and they could all be very, very different, and they could all have very different needs in some ways. Another challenge, another difficulty. Um, as a result, assessment can be really useful when working with a child in order to understand what is the unique <coughs> needs of this child. Sam and Chris are pretty different. What are their needs? What's going on for Sam and Chris? Why does Sam sit there and vibrate? What's going on with Sam? What's happening? How can I best manage that? Chris is so quiet. Doesn't say a peep. What is that? Maybe Chris just doesn't understand a lot of language. Maybe Chris is sitting there going, boy, I sure wish I could understand what somebody was saying in this class. Or maybe if they talked a little slower, I would know what's going on. Assessment helps us to answer some of those questions. Um, being a psychologist, of course, I'm, that's one opportunity I have to sort of enter the picture with teachers and work with you, is when I have the opportunity to work with a child, do an assessment, I can provide information and then continue to collaborate and work with teachers to say what is the best fit for a child. Now, I realize that saying assessment it's a challenging service for a lot of people to get, and not everybody has access to it. So I understand that there are some barriers, but I'm still going to talk about the value of this and the value of having an assessment. The majority of kids who have a diagnosis of FASD will have at some time had an assessment to have gotten that diagnosis. There at some point should have been, for the majority of them, a diagnosis. That there should be some information available about that child. And accessing that information and picking up the phone and calling that psychologist is one way to get to that information. Knowing the child. I'm going to talk a bit more <coughs> about how do we get to know the child. I've talked about challenges. I've said, why are they unique? What's, 
um, what's making it a challenge to work with this child in your classroom. So one of the things I think that's really important is getting to know that child. And I don't think this is anything new for you guys. Of course you want to get to know the child. That's how you meet their needs. These are not brand new things. I'm not coming here with rocket science today or startling revelations. But I want us to really think about them. Knowing the child, back to the assessment. Assessment, when you're looking at it, um, one of the things I guess I want to invite you guys, all of you, you know, who are here today um, watching to do, is really be critical consumers of assessment. I'm speaking as a psychologist who does assessments, and my colleagues, if any of them are watching this, or <laughs> maybe they're not, um, but the ones I work with, you know, groan sometimes when I start this. But you know what? You guys are the ones who are provided with this information and who hopefully are going to be in a position to help use this information to make a plan and support a child. And so part of what I want to talk about today is, is being able to be critical consumers and being able to say, hang on a minute, I got this document in front of me that's 25 pages of techno babble and I have no idea what you're talking about. I would like you to break it down and tell me what I can do for my kid in my, this classroom. Help me out here. Let's talk. Pick up the phone and do that. And you know what? To be honest, some of my colleagues might kind of go, who do you think you are? And I'm sorry for that. However, there's a lot of people, and I think we're getting better at being team players, and I think, you know, we want to have that phone call, and we want to sit down and say, okay, yeah, let's talk about this kid. What can we do? How can we strategize? How can we problem solve? I mean, this is sort of where Marjorie and I have had that experience in, in, in talking and strategizing and, and planning a bit. An assessment can provide you information about a child's level of attention. Is attention a problem for a child? Um, is there things that you need to do to help them manage attention? An assessment should give you information about what we call executive functioning. Executive functioning is a big umbrella term as well. We have a lot of umbrella terms. It doesn't really mean anything on its own. What it refers to are skills like judgment, cause and effect. If this, then this. Can I do that? If this happens, then this is going to happen. Do I have the ability to do that? That's a pretty important skill to have. A lot of kids with FASD don't have it. Huge impact on their ability to function. That's the kind of skills we're looking at. Sort of skills for independence, skills for problem solving, skills that really help us to be functional day to day. <coughs> All right? Those are the kinds of skills that we're talking about when we say executive functioning. Intelligence. Where is this child's level of functioning? A lot of kids with FASD have intelligence that is well within the average range. A lot of them. Some of them well above the average range. Yes. <laughs> Marjorie can speak to that. You know, intelligence in itself does not mean whether or not a child has FASD. A child could have an intelligence that's really, really good, still have FASD. Having it and using it are two different things. Just because you have an IQ doesn't mean you can use that intelligence functionally on a day-to-day -day basis. So sometimes, you know, an assessment needs to give you information about that. It needs to say, well, this kid is really, really bright. However, there are some big gaps, and these are where those gaps are. And this is what it's going to mean for this child on a day-to-day -day basis. This is going to how, how it's going to impact their functioning. Because they're going to understand things, they're going to get it, and then they're not going to be able to do it. How frustrating is that? To watch yourself fail over and over and over again, knowing what the other options were, but feeling like you just don't know what the steps are to make the change. Oh, that would be excruciating. I'd be frustrated. No wonder some of these kids get so mad and upset with themselves. I don't know, Marjorie, if you want to add to that, well, seeing as you've had some. I think it's also important to, to take a look at um, assessment in the areas of secondary disabilities, uh -huh. because those really impact the primary disability and really uh, make a difference in the functioning of the child. And I also think it's important to know that these assessments need to be redone every two to five years, depending on the child and their needs. You know, if you're looking, if the kid's 15 years old and you're looking at an assessment that was done when they were nine, it needs to be redone. Because people grow and change. Case in point, my youngest child, excuse me, our youngest <coughs> child, my husband gets very upset when I say mine. Our youngest child was initially, uh, and all our kids are adopted, we were told she had an IQ of 78. And that was fine with me. I was quite re willing to deal with an IQ of 78. However, once we had her for a couple of years and taught her how to talk, her IQ went up to 127. Well, how does that happen? 
I, the IQ test that is used on small children is, is based on their ability to respond to questions. If the child can't speak, how do they respond? And therefore, it was chalked up to lack of intelligence, when really it was lack of ability to speak. When she could speak, her IQ went, I mean, her IQ didn't go up, but it became 127. So my point is, these, t these assessments are extremely valuable, but they need to be current as well. And, and those are questions that are, are really even legitimate. It's like, okay, I've got a child, this is their IQ, but you know, they don't talk at all. Do you think that has any bearing? I mean, <laughs> these are what psychologists should be saying. <coughs> you know, they should be saying, this child's IQ is coming out of this right now. However, when I look at the environment, when I look at the factors around them, I don't think it's a good estimate. I think we need to watch this child, support this child like crazy over the next little while, and reevaluate. In other words, we don't necessarily want to make predictions based on this information. We want to use this information to plan for the child right now, respond to the child's needs right now, but let's not make assumptions that this information is going to mean this in two years, because it can change. <coughs> and also springing off the point you made about you know, when you look at IQ, there's various types of IQ. There's and, you know, a performance IQ, verbal IQ. I have one child who has a verbal IQ of 87 and a performance IQ of 130. So she's got a learning disability. However, when you are so capable, more capable than almost anyone your age in certain areas, and yet so in her perception so less capable in other areas, that huge contrast really, uh, that kid really took a hit in the self-esteem area. And it followed her all through her school career because of this huge disparity between so competent and, but I can barely talk and I can't read. It's like a tug of war. It's like, I get it on this level, but I can only say it on this level. And I'm very frustrated because school is reading and writing. Yeah, and this is that. Again, this is information that you can get through this medium and should be getting. <coughs> and if you're not getting it, this is stuff to ask for. Um, yeah. So what assessments are you recommending? Because I know like this neural psych stuff is very effective, but there's not really one best assessment. So yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly, I, in a perfect world, I would recommend neuropsych for sure, because a neuropsych assessment, the difference is <coughs> it's an assessment that looks at brain function as well as. So it will say, what's this child's IQ, for instance, that we've been talking about. Well, we'll go a lot further into el other elements of brain function. The real cream of the crop in terms of assessment, again, if I really say the cream of the crop, is a team assessment. Um, the Glen Rose, for example, has an FASD diagnostic team. I'll speak to them because they are awesome there. Um, they do a fantastic job, and they can provide you with information about a child in terms of their neuropsychological functioning. So how is their brain working on tests that we look at brain with and, and uh, intelligence and those kinds of questions. However, they also have a speech language pathologist that looks at speech and language all through the years. Even in, you know, uh, older kids, junior high and high school kids, they see and they look at that. They have an occupational therapist who's looking at certain abilities. They have a uh, developmental pediatrician. They have a social worker who's involved in getting a lot of context and background information. And then we work very intensively with teachers. And we phone teachers and we talk to teachers and we invite them to be a part of case conferences. We say, come to the case conference. Be a part of the process. We invite collaboration. We say, we want to stay in touch with you. Things like that. Um, yes, the, I mean, I'm not with the I'm not on the team anymore at the Glen Rose. I was, and, and so I, I admit that bias as I rave about them. But they're not the only team that does that. There are other teams like that. I think that's the best practice. But I do think that a, a neuropsych assessment, if you've got a neuropsych from a psychologist, is next best. Um, after that, it, you know, we do the best we can with the information we have. Yes? How early do you think we should start the assessments? How old should the child be? How old should the child be when we start the assessments? Um, that's a really challenging question. Uh, generally speaking, I think around when they're entering school age. I mean, sometimes you'll deal with parents who are really struggling with a child, and in that case, an assessment may be, you know, valuable earlier in their age. Um, at those early years, it's really difficult to get a clear picture of brain function because there's so much changing in terms of development, so much variation. I will very, very rarely say that a young child has FASD 
but I will talk about supports we can do at a young child age. Once we get to sort of six, seven years old, <coughs> then I feel like we have a bit more confidence. Although sometimes, if environmental or factors like that make the picture kind of murky and it's like, well, there's a lot of this, there's a lot of that, we'll recommend a lot of supports and a lot of strategies and we'll say, let's do all of these things first and play another wait and see game and see what happens. And so we really like to promote development, support de development as much as we can, not just say, you fit in this hole, boom, you've got this, bye bye have a nice life. What we want to do is really look at more process work and what can we do to really um, support these kids and not just sort of dive in. By the time we hit eight or nine, we can have a lot more confidence. By that point, I, I feel a lot more confidence in, in assessment. I also think with the younger kids, um, oftentimes, <coughs> pardon me, health nurses who are immunizing and seeing these children and looking at their development are the ones to first pick up that there's a problem. It's yeah. not defined as FASD, yeah. but they look at it in terms of symptoms, like do they have a language delay? Is there an attention problem? Are they engaging in, in parallel play instead of playing with other kids? They're the, they s often are the people that know, that they know there's something not quite right, but at that point, they're too young to be diagnosed with FASD, as you say. So you take a look at what the symptoms are and try to recommend programs. Like we have some really good early ed programs in Alberta that are PUF funded and it's a team approach. And it really gives these kids a solid foundation to continue on into the regular school system. Yeah, they're, they're fantastic. And, and I'm not sure out of province as much. I know there are some good programs for those of you who are watching from out of province. But uh, I will, yeah, the, certainly some of the early education programs in Alberta are fantastic and, and really, really great. And, and, and again, they don't need a diagnosis of FASD to get into early education programs in Alberta. In Alberta, you can get into those programs just with a description of areas where there's a significant problem. And so that's enough to qualify for the funding for those programs. So it, it's great for that. Um, any other questions? I'm sorry, we've jumped through a few things here, but I'll kind of <coughs> catch us up as, as we go. Um, so we've talked about some of the things that should be in an assessment. The lady with the Was red there another hood? question? Yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry. Accessing the assessments. Accessing the assessments. Ah, uh, yes, accessing the assessments. I knew that question would come up. Okay. That's a challenge. One thing to do is to go, if you want to access things like um, these uh, team assessments that I'm really extolling and saying the the, the, the cream of the crop. Those things are hard to get and yes there's a long waiting list. However you can uh, encourage if you've got families who are really interested in working with you or they're saying yeah we really want to know um, what you need to get to those ones is a physician's referral to the site. So for example the Glen Rose team you need a physician's referral and then they kind of route them through. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you uh, as a teacher can kind of be an advocate and an information provider for caregivers saying here's one way. There's also um, you know, professionals who do this as well. That could be another way. Um, I most, think, yeah. Most um, here's here's a school person who could really <laughs> speak to what well, you guys can access. I do this. So most most school districts have a process mm -hmm. that their administrators or and school counselors are keenly aware of of how to access these services. And in fact, some of the funding and coding is dependent on a certain process and certain kinds of assessment. So you'd be wise to speak to your school administrators and school counselors to see what the process is in your particular school district to access these services. Now the time that Jackie, excuse me, uh, the opportunity that Jackie and I had to work together previous to this was one of my students who was referred by us through the physician to their team. And yes, it was a long waiting list, but it was well worth the wait. The information we got was extremely valuable. So, you know, there is a process in most school districts. You just have to find out what that process is. And, and I think, you know, realistically, it's not always going <coughs> to be easy, and, and you're not going to get always what you ask for or what we, what we really need. And advocacy and continuing to adv advocate for it, I think, is one of just a good thing that we can do. I mean, we need to speak up. The more we speak up, it doesn't mean we'll always get what we want, but people, the louder our voice gets, maybe that helps. And, and, and you know, that's a step towards getting this information. Um, assessment, and, and I think we've sort of talked about this already, is more than one contact. Um, when you get an assessment, if all you're getting is a piece <coughs> of paper and then no contact and you're sitting here trying to work your way through this report that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, that's not a good assessment. A good assessment is where you are involved, where you're talking to that psychologist, where that person has some kind of interaction with you. 
and I'm not trying to judge my colleagues. Like I said, I think they're wonderful and they're busy and they're doing a lot. But I don't think it's too much for you guys to say, hang on a minute, I need to talk to you. I want to know what you mean by this. You've listed 15 things you think I'm supposed to do in the classroom with this child. Okay, I don't have time to do one of them. Can we talk about something I actually can do? And that's where you can just pick up the phone and say, hi, I've got this assessment you did on this child. Can we talk? Okay, get the permission from parents and, and take, do, take those steps. I'd encourage you. I realize it's time consuming. I realize, you know, sitting down, picking up the phone, sometimes it doesn't feel like there's enough hours in the day. But I think if you get the right information and the right collaboration early on, in the long haul, it's going to shorten your day. In the long haul, it's going to make a difference. It's worth the early investment of time to kind of pursue that. Um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, in addition, on these assessments, you know, we're talking about areas of difficulty in supporting a child. It's also really important that we look to where the child's strengths are. Marjorie mentioned, you know, how sometimes you get these huge splits in skill sets. It's really important that we don't just talk about what areas a child has difficulty in, but also what areas a child has strength in because that's what the interventions can build on and those are the strengths that we really want to foster and grow in these children because there are strengths. I've yet to meet a child without strengths. Never have. They all have some, it takes more time to find, some children are a bit more challenging, truth be told. However, I've yet to find a child that I could not find some strengths and something to build on and that's part of what these assessments should have, give us is that foundation to build. On the next slide, it's just kind of getting after frame of reference. I think we've sort of alluded to this already as well. Understand the underlying reason for their behavior. A lot of children with FASD may pose behavioral challenges in your classroom. That's not unusual. One of our kind of goals is to really understand what is going on for a given child. Sometimes children who can't look a lot like children who won't. And it's important for us to kind of know when it is can't and when is it won't. Which one is it? Um, that's important information for us to have. It, it's also, it yeah. also varies significantly with each child. I mean, I have, mm -hmm. I have four FASD sure. children, and I have uh, one who, um, they learn very interesting coping skills to try to bluff uh, the, the adults and the important people in their life when they can't do something. We often see the behaviors. If we're asking them to do something that they're not really confident about and they're afraid they're going to make a mistake, then we see the behaviors because it deflects us from the real problem. Behavior is often a symptom of a bigger problem. It's not the problem. Well, and, and for Even a lot of it kids, it seems like yeah. it at times. And uh, for a lot of kids, it's more <laughs> desirable to be the bad kid than the dumb kid. I mean, which one do you want to be? The bad kid or the dumb kid? Because the bad kid has control. Absolutely. Has Absolutely. total control. And, and, and you know, that's that's a huge difference and these kids a lot of them they get that oh yeah they get that and they know what's the better one for them and so part of it is us saying what's the function of this behavior mm -hmm. how is this behavior serving them because chances are it is it's not serving us <laughs> it's causing us grief but it's somehow serving this child and if we can answer that question then we can support them if we can figure out what ser what it's doing mm -hmm. for them we can support them. <coughs> On to the next slide. So we kind of covered the root of the behavior there. I'm jumping ahead to the next slide where we talk about communication with caregivers. And as you can tell, even listening to Marjorie here, communicating with a caregiver can be really valuable. You know, you're not able to get a hold of a psychologist, you feel like you're on your own, and you're sitting here listening to me talk about assessment and know the individual child, and you're pulling your hair out because you're thinking, well, I don't have that. The caregiver is also a really valuable source of information. All right, the caregiver can sometimes give you really good tips as to what's working with their child, um, what is a to do, what is a don't do. My child's got 177 IQ. You let her get away with anything, and she's going to walk circles around you. And does. And sh knowing that can be really valuable. What works? What do you do? What What works at home when she starts walking circles around you at home? What do you do? Well, I do this. Oh, okay, I can do that in the classroom. That does work. And then, in the classroom, I'm doing the same thing as is being done at home. I don't have to retrain. I'm just going to do what she's already <laughs> doing at home. Sweet. That's less work for me. I don't have to go over that again. Working with the caregiver, that's a great support person, or can be a great support person for you. All right. Hey, may I? Please. It's also, may really, I? it's also really important when you're talking with caregivers uh, to understand that sometimes... Um, for example, my, our youngest daughter is 10 years old. She has 
she is ARND. She's, uh, it's a branch of FAST. She also has a, a really serious but rare mental disorder called reactive attachment disorder, uh, which makes her an extremely difficult child to parent, but she's also a very, very smart child. And she loves to see what kind of reaction she can get. She tells almost every single new adult that she meets that we abuse her. Almost everyone, which is total nonsense. But she loves the reaction that she gets from these people. It's really, really important that you check with caregivers you know, to see whether or not these kids are giving you the straight goods. Mm -hmm. And if you're worried about that, then go to your administrator and say, this is what so-and-so's told me. Can you check this out for me? Because again, it deviates from the problem at hand. If you're trying to make her do math and she's saying, oh, you know, my mother abused me last night. I can't do math. Her goal is to get out of doing math. It has nothing to do with what's happened at home. And, and for our kid with the 127 IQ, she's hooked a few people in and gotten out of a lot of math. And that's her goal. <coughs> because you've got this very large child in a 10-year-old body who can easily be 10 one minute and 5 the next and doesn't want to do math. So work with these people, talk to these caregivers. You know, we do have some information that will really help you when you're dealing with our children. And the common language thing is crucial. Uh, our, she's in a, a, a site that's using a token system. And so we use some of that same language at home. You know, that's a defiance fall. You get 30 minutes in your room for lipping me off. Oh, you're just like my teacher, and up the stairs she goes, right? But she's getting the same kind of thing at home that she is at school, and it's working really well. She's not having to try to manipulate two sets of adults, you know? And, and when you're in that kind of communication, too, it does help when those <coughs> kinds of stories and things come up, because sometimes they will. And, and for and a lot of kids, too, with FASD, they're going to say things like that. Well, my mom, you know, was hitting me last night. That's why I didn't finish my homework. OK, does this child really understand the implications of trying to say that about her child? Not necessarily. I mean, she's saying, well, this is going to divert attention. I love the reaction it gets. But if we were to really react and, okay, we've got to get this involved and that involved, get the child out of the home, all these things happening, does that child actually know that those are the next steps to come? No. No, no, no. This is not what she's trying to accomplish. That's not what she wants. She <coughs> just doesn't want you making her do her math homework. And so understanding, now that's not to say that every child who says, my mom hit me last night, should be ignored. We, you want to think about it, but that's where that relationship with the caregiver comes in. If you have that relationship, you can go, yeah, I was talking to your mom last night. <laughs> That's right. I know the, the truth is here. You know, you, you can have a bit different sense. And if you are in doubt ever, of course, as Marjorie said, go through the administrator, follow the routes. I mean, child safety is important. But no, it's not unusual. These things are not unusual that that kind of thing happens. Um, so caregivers, very, very important. Uh, caregivers and assessment, both of these kinds of things can help identify reasonable expectations as well. What are reasonable expectations? What can I ask of this child that is reasonable and when is it not reasonable? A lot of times you're going to know what you, when you've hit not reasonable because the behavior is going to tell you or all of a sudden they're telling you stories or something starts to happen. Okay, That's always a good indicator that you've passed the threshold of expectance. But it's good to have an idea ahead of time. What's a reasonable expectation to have for a child? Can you set goals? Of course you can set goals. Can you expect growth and change? Of course you can, absolutely. But reasonably, reasonably, and with a little bit of allowance for a bit of day-to-day -day give and take. But we can still do these things. Collaboration, back to collaboration again, be it with caregivers or assessments. One of the things you can do as well is look at priorities. I talked earlier about a cluster of problems. We've discussed a few different things that you might see. Sometimes what you have to do is prioritize the problems. Otherwise, you look at this list and you go, how are we going to deal with all these things? How am I going to manage their behavior, the attention problem, um, and the learning difficulties all at the same time? Like, wow, that's a full plate. Start with one. What's the biggest presenting thing to begin with? What's the biggest problem to begin with? All right, it's the fact that, you know, they pick up their desk and throw it across the room half the OK, that's a big one. Let's deal with that. Let's start there. And then let's go to the next thing, and let's go to the next thing. So we're not tackling. Prioritizing, breaking it down a little bit, makes it more accessible. It's also less on the child. We're not trying to change the child's entire world to do it all at one time. Working in collaboration, working with a caregiver, working with a psychologist, working with other professionals that you may have available to you who have some knowledge in the area or may have some suggestions, other teachers who have worked with this child. Who are other teachers who've had this child before? Maybe they found some things that worked. Collaborating with one another, talking. 
I think that's one of the things that I've found to be most effective is, is that working together, prioritizing needs, and that way kind of identifying some strategies. Challenge your priorities. This is one, and, and I put this in as much for myself as anything, is I think sometimes when we're thinking about how to best respond to the needs of a child, we have to think about, okay, I've got to look at the mirror and think about, first of all, what I'm expecting and what I'm all about, right? I have to do that all the time. Sometimes I'll get in a room with a kid, and I'll start working with them, <coughs> and I'll be like, ooh, this kid's driving me crazy. I'm like, got to take a minute, got to go out, and I've got to figure out what my problem is, because I can make some adjustments, and I can go in, and then I can find some common ground. I just sometimes have to work a bit harder to do it. But that's something, you know, I've kind of discovered. And, and so I'm thinking, you know, what, what things do we need to keep in mind in terms of our practice and what we can do? Flexibility and adaptability, really important for us. Really important for us in the classroom or in our work, of places of work, to say, you know what, this isn't working. Their behavior, everything that's going on is telling me this isn't working. I need to make a change. Even though it's something I'm comfortable doing, even though it works in my class for everyone else, I need to make a change at least in regards to this child. I need to be flexible because this child, it may not be flexible. I got to kind of meet this child where they're at. Find out where they need to go because sometimes we will have much more mobility than they will uh, in that regard. Being hopeful and seeing potential in the child I really would challenge everybody who works with anyone with FASD is as early on as you start working with that child, try to identify in that child something you like about that child, something you see as a strength in that child, something you see as a point of potential. Identify something. I'm not saying you have to have this list that's huge. Just something that you see, you know, that kid is funny. Sometimes they don't always use the humor the way they should and sometimes it's a problem, but you know what, they're funny. I'm going to hang on to that because that's something I can use, and that's something I can remember, and that's something I can come back to. And that's something on those really sour days at the end of the day when I go, I don't think I can do this anymore, maybe I can come back to. The risk is if we don't find those strengths, if we don't kind of really concentrate on seeing the potential, sometimes this is a group that it's easy just to get frustrated with and give up on. And you guys know better than anyone, you give up on a child and they know it they know it. I don't care what level they're functioning at. They know it. And we never want to get to that point. And I mean, you guys wouldn't be in the teaching profession, you wouldn't be working with kids if you wanted that or if you ever chose to go there. But it happens because we're human. Finding the strengths, seeking the strengths, looking towards potential sometimes can help us offset that a little bit and, and help us to really kind of stay, keep that at least in the focus, okay? Using resources to help understand the child. Did you want to jump in there? Were you had a thought I just before I keep going? It's you just like totally railroad here. Come on, Marjorie. <laughs> jump in. Otherwise, I just keep going. <laughs> well, I find also as a teacher and a parent that some of these, we have our bag of tricks. I've been teaching for 29 years, and I, yes. you know, I have a fairly good repertoire of things that work. Uh, <laughs> they don't always work with these kind of kids. And if you add that RAD uh, on top of it all, they rarely work. So to redevelop this bag of tricks after they've worked for you for 20 years or 15 years or 25 years can be really quite frustrating at times. I found focusing on one thing really helped. Rather than trying to do the full meal deal at one time, focusing on one thing, talking to the child about what would you like to change, what upsets you, well, kids won't play with me. Well, how can we make it better so that they will? And focus on one thing that they're willing to get on board, even you know, and my daughter will say, yeah, I want to do this, and then some kid will call her a name, and the next day she doesn't. But you need to bring her around to, I really do want to do this. It's just hard work. And then she's willing to buy in. Try the one behavior thing rather than trying to do it all at one time. Awesome. <coughs> um, using resources, again, back to understanding the child. Careful around jumping to conclusions. It's easy for us to see a behavior as a behavior. It's easy for us, and, and again, I'm speaking as much for myself because I look at these things and I go, this is what it is. It's you know, easier to see the angry child as just being a mean child or a destructive child when in fact they're a frustrated child or a scared child or a child who just doesn't understand and doesn't want you to know it. And so just checking our conclusions, checking that we're kind of thinking these things through informed regarding intervention and support options. I mean, that's why you guys are doing this, is you're trying to get informed. You're like, okay, what's going on out there? What do I need to know? And I think this is awesome. I think this learning series is great. I think it's fantastic that these are opportunities that we have available to us. 
And, and even for me, I mean, I get excited when I get to spend time with a group of teachers because I learn something every time. And so I think that these are great opportunities, and, and I'm, I think it's thrilled that so many people are really interested in doing it. So those are some thoughts, some general thoughts. Now, let's get into some more specific things. What specific strategies can I use in the classroom? What can I do in the classroom? Okay, well, there are a lot of things, and, and Marjorie just said it beautifully. You know, you've all got your bag of tricks. And some of those tricks are going to work. A lot of them aren't. The ones that do work may work differently, or you may have to adjust the way you use it. And that comes back to that flexibility piece. A lot of the things I'm going to talk about, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm not going to tell you guys what are good classroom strategies and things like that. You already know that. <coughs> but we're going to talk about sort of differences, the way you might use something differently, um, or things to keep in mind while you're using things. In the classroom. We're in the classroom now. Routine. You guys know this. Routine is important. It's important for all kids. Kids like routine. Kids like structure. That's the way it is. FASD children are no exception. In fact, they like it more. More structure, generally. I mean, they won't tell you they like it more. <laughs> I'm sure they won't. Um, but you know what? It works for them. High levels of structure, generally speaking, are really good. Lots of supports, lots of visual reminders to help support that structure. I say visual reminders because often visual skills are stronger. As Marjorie talked about, you know, it's not unusual to see kids who have verbal skills that are quite a bit weaker than their visual skills. However, that is not all kids. Know your unique child. I have seen children with FASD with exactly the opposite, where their verbal skills were their strength and their visual skills were their weakness. I have seen, like, radically so. So they're out there too. Know your unique child. However, for depending on what their strengths are, having reminders and having things like that to help structure that and help provide routine is helpful. It is, and it's also really helpful if you can get parents to help you do that. Oh, yes. Um, I know with, there's, there's a, I, I'm a high school teacher. I trained as a high school teacher. <coughs> but I walk around in my school and I see these lovely little balanced literacy pocket charts, right, with the plastic on the front. So I made one for our house, and I have it on the front door. So when the child sees it as she goes out, and it's got a picture of her agenda, a picture of her bag, a picture of her lunch, a picture of whatever it is she needs to take to school that day. Because not being organized and having everything she owns all over the house was driving me nuts. And I changed the cards. Like if it's soccer, I put the soccer shoes in. I put the jersey in. And she loves it, and there's no more problem. So parent, you can get parents on board. Like if you're using an agenda system to communicate with your parent and the child cannot remember to bring the agenda, suggest that they use some kind of system. And sometimes the calendar works, but if they're picture people, the writing doesn't help. So I just made this little chart and in goes the cards and all her stuff goes to school. Teachers are a lot less frustrated and so am I because I'm getting the things back that I need. And it works well and it's so simple. Well, and, I've, and I've seen parents and teachers work together to do things exactly what Marjorie is discussing, like where they'll have at home a little backpack uh, rack, just a hook for mm -hmm. the kids to hang their backpack when they come home. And above that hook is a picture of the things, a little lunch kit, a little uh, agenda book maybe, and something else. And then the parent can go and put, you know, okay, do we have all these things? Yes, we do. And at school, that exact same picture sits with their, where their coat rack is and where their backpack goes. So at the end of the day, they're looking at the exact same picture, looking for their agenda, their lunch book, and, and what, you know, or their, their lunch bag, their lunch box, what are they? But those, so the exact same picture is both at home and at school. So they're not having to adjust to different pictures. They're not having to work between, I think Marjorie said earlier, two different languages. Mm -hmm. They've got the same language. They've got the same visual language or verbal language between both settings. That can be fantastic. Um, and that's really effective. And, and even, you know, there's, you can put visual reminders on a desk. If there's things they need to remember that, you know, that would make sense to have on their desk. Sometimes visual schedules can be nice to have on their desk. Um, they could have a Monday schedule, a Tuesday schedule, a Wednesday, and each day you just have to help them. Okay, it's Monday. Let's make sure your Monday schedule is taped on or the first one in the pocket or little things like that. Trying to be preventative and trying to be proactive <coughs> as opposed to reactive and going, oh, man, you forgot this again. Or, oh, man, you didn't do this again. The more we can prevent those oh, man moments and say, okay, we've got it all, the better off, the less frustrated the child is, and the more success the child is having, and the more they're able to define themselves by their successes, as opposed to how many things I forgot today. There's also, there's also um, conditions in some of these children where 
they either feel things too much or they don't feel things enough. Like my daughter doesn't feel cold. She's in serious risk of frostbite. So she will try to head out the door in a pair of shorts and her thongs. And remember when we had that cold snap in December? I caught her twice going out the front door dressed like that because okay. she doesn't feel cold. So the cards, again, this is what you need to wear for this day. Whether you feel it or not isn't the issue. You're at risk. And she's now, she now looks for the cues, and that's one less mountain that I have to deal with in the mornings. Things can be... There are, she has so many difficulties with the RAD diagnosis. She's obsessive compulsive. She's got attachment issues. That's not the mountain I want to die on. I don't want that to make, make that the biggest deal in her day. There's more other things that are more important. So if we can help her and kids like her, because there's lots of them, by just putting a few pictures up on a door, mm -hmm. why not? Yeah, and, and I think it's these supports are, are really helping take these children towards <coughs> success. And, and a lot of the kids that you work with are going to have a lot of additional mental health difficulties. It's not just, you know, there's it's a real mix. There's a lot of things they're dealing with. And the more we can support them and the more we can kind of facilitate success, the better we're doing for these kids. There's a, a body of research actually in process right now in Burlington, Ontario, uh, where an MD and several MDs in his clinic are taking a look at um, FASD not being, that mental health issues not, are not a secondary issue with FASD. They're also a primary issue. Yeah. And that every child with an FASD diagnosis will have secondary mental health issues at some point in their life. Mm -hmm. So this isn't just an add-on anymore. I mean, his research hasn't been published, but this isn't just an add-on anymore. It's a reality. It's becoming <coughs> a reality. And he's tying it. There, there's a lot of research in general mm -hmm. into mental health right now that talks about the differences between the, the organic or the brain-based aspects of mental health and the environment aspect, environmental aspects of mental health. So mental health is being described as having both things, just as we talk about with FASD. And so absolutely, when we look at the differently wired and differently functioning brain, what we're saying is, you know what? We think these brains are different when it comes to mental health. We also think that it's not unusual that a lot of these kids also come from environments or perhaps biological parents where there was more mental health as well, yeah. which is another thing. So for example, <laughs> a child who is affected by alcohol in utero may be affected because mom was really, really depressed when she was pregnant. It's not a horrible mom here. We have a mom who was just so depressed that she just that was that was all that she had. And so when we have that much depression with mom potentially, the odds that we have a child with depression goes up quite a bit. Add on brain wired a little bit differently, maybe more vulnerable because of the brain wiring, odds for depression mm -hmm. go up further. And then potentially add on a third component, which could be environmental stressors early in their life, which is not unusual. And boom, we've just thrown the top off, and the odds we have mental health are huge. And so this combination mm -hmm. and overlay of these contributing pieces mean that you guys, again, are dealing with the kids with complex, clustered problems. Through and no fault of their own. Through no fault That's of their the own. That's the part I have no to keep remembering. It's through own. no fault of their own. Um, our youngest child gets so, she knows she's not like other kids and it really bothers her. Mm -hmm. And she's really not old, I mean, she's beginning to get it, but she really doesn't understand why she's not like other kids. And it really bothers her and I have to keep reminding her that, you know, it's not her fault. She has to deal with it and she has to move on, but she didn't cause the problem. And then she seems okay for a little while and she can kind of keep going, mm -hmm. you know. And you'll see that, and you'll see that in kids. Other times you're going to see children <coughs> with FASD who don't have that same kind of insight, and they may not realize they have any problems. And you'll say, you'll be looking and you'll go, wow, you're not doing well in school, you're getting fights all the time, you're having trouble, at er, you know, you're looking at them going, my goodness, there's a lot of concerns. And you talk to them and you say, how are you doing? Great. Yeah. Well, how, how's your life? Do you, do you have a lot of difficulties? You know, I've talked to your teacher, I've talked to your mom, I know there's some trouble. No, it's great. It's really good. They talk, and it's wonderful. And I'm like, wow, OK. But you know what? It's not all bad. They, you know, sometimes these kids don't fully understand what's happening in their lives. That's not unusual either. And that's not necessarily just a kid who's kind of faking it. And that's not necessarily a kid who doesn't care. It's not a kid who says, I don't care that all these things are going wrong. That's a child who truly doesn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Some kids will have great insight and will be really troubled by the fact they feel different. Other children will be completely oblivious and they don't realize, you know, it's good. My life is good. It's not that they don't care. I think also though the fight flight re reflex kicks in big time because I've got two who are right in my face 
and I've got two who are withdraw when, when they're under pressure. Yep. Uh, and again, they're all FASD, but they're totally different in how they react to stress and things that are going on around them. And so to try to engineer an intervention, it's not, it's not a box. It's not a one-size-fits-all. You have to really know the kids in order to help them. Yeah. You're going to need to be, again, mm -hmm. flexible and willing to really know what are the needs of this child because it's not one-size-fits-all. No. It's once I know this <coughs> child, then I can find the right fit for them. Which, coming back to what we were saying earlier about communication, makes the communication piece really, really important. Because if you do find what fits, if you do find something that really works, communicate <coughs> that. Let the next teacher know, hey, this is what works. Right? Be communicating forward as well as going backwards for information. Let people know because that's better for the child. The more you can communicate things forward. To the next teacher coming along, pass your whole team on to them. Pass the whole team, pass the whole support system on so that they're not starting at, you know, September, starting fresh all over again, brand new. This poor child, no wonder they loathe September, right? Their September is like, oh, it takes these so long before things get rolling. Finally, June, I'm in, I'm in the zone. Things are going well, and it's all over. And then I have to start all over again. That's challenging. That's tough for these guys. Well, that's part of the, 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 the nice, one of the nice things about the IPP process in yeah. Alberta is we have in individual program plans for students. It's a, I mean, it, it's a provincial mandate if kids are coded, but we do them anyway, even if, we don't, if a kid's not coded, but we feel that they're at risk because it sets out a plan of action. It, there's a communication plan with parents. All the experts have been brought in and consulted with, mm -hmm. and that plan stays in the f student's file or on the computer for that next teacher. So you're not starting off at square one again. Yeah. And if you get an IPP like that, and you've got that, so you're not starting off at square one, and there have been professionals consulted in the compilation, putting that together, <coughs> it's not always a bad thing to say, OK, got the IPP, but let me talk to this professional too. So here I am in September. I've read this, but I want to hear from them a little bit, and I want to establish a relationship in case I need to touch base with them as I get started. Because I got a slightly different class, and I'm a slightly different person, so there's still a lot of transitions for this child. I may need to collaborate a bit. Do that ahead of time. Do that in September as early as you can or as early as you get a hold of that information. That might be a good start. And then you've got somebody backing you up. You have somebody else you can pick up the phone and say, all right, what do I have any suggestions here? And you also, you also like, if you've got a, a child like mine with the RAD on top of it, yes. she sees June 30th as abandonment. She doesn't get that you leave one teacher and you go to the next teacher, even <coughs> though she's in grade five. Yes. To her, that adult, that is yet another adult who has abandoned her and let her down. So if you're the September teacher, if you, and you don't know that, you could get really upset by the way she presents initially, because she can be quite hostile until sh that relationship is built again. Because this is a child who's had a, a history of adults, in her mind, abandoning her, letting her down. Her needs weren't met. She doesn't trust adults. And then another teacher leaves her. And she's very, like, egocentric as well, right? So the teacher's left her. It doesn't matter the teacher's left the school or gone to have a baby or there's a whole other classroom of kids there. It's all about her, yeah. right? The world, the world is this big. Exactly. The world is this and big. And so the next teacher could be the sweetest person in the world, but if you don't know that, it's tough. It's really tough. And again, communication with the caregiver will really help with that. Yeah. And I mean, it's not going to make it all better, but at least if you have a sense of what's going on and why it's going on, you might feel like, okay, I can manage this a bit more because at least I know where it's coming from. At well, a lot, a lot of our interventions are based on what's the, co what's the reason for this. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand the reason, it's hard to set up any kind of intervention. Yeah, yeah, because then you're trying to solve a behavioral problem, which might not be a behavioral no. problem at all. It could be something entirely different. Well, her, with her, it's an abandonment issue. Absolutely, and you would respond to that far differently. A child who's got an abandonment issue and is lipping off a teacher needs a very different response than we would take for a child who doesn't have those same issues, who is responding to a teacher that way. Very different responses needed. And I mean, there's no box response to that. Again, no. you need to know the child. You need to know the unique uh, <coughs> needs of that child in order to say, OK, how do I tailor the necessary response? But at least you know where to start and have the questions and say, OK, what's going on here? I need to know that in order to build a response that makes sense for this child. <coughs> and then. My next, the next point there that sort of builds on, on what we're saying here is to not remove the supports with success. Sometimes what we do 
is, you know, we like to see children grow and develop. And so we put wonderful supports in place, and these children start to do great, and they're doing awesome. So then we slowly kind of peel them back. We say, okay, now you're managing this so well on your own, you don't need this anymore. And that's normal and typical, and that's something we do, and that facilitates development with a lot of typically developing children. That can be really good. This is a population where if you find a good fit, if the supports are working, if things are moving along, don't change it. It means you found the right fit. It means you found the right environment for success. The child will grow and develop, and there may be a few things that will kind of go by on the wayside, but not a lot. If you're seeing growth and development and success within a framework of support, keep it there. Let's not remove it. I sometimes compare it to wearing glasses. I wear glasses or contacts, depending on the day. And with them, I see well. With them, I can read. With them, I can walk without tripping. With them, I'm not going into as many walls. Take them away. Get up in the middle of the night, with, put my glasses on. I'm falling. I'm hitting the walls. I'm having some difficulty. So I wear my glasses. I have success. I need that support, just as part of who I am. Just kind of gives me a kind of a point of comparison. When you find what works, when you get the right prescription, wear it. Keep it going, because that's what's going to help facilitate success. That's what's going to make the world a better fit for a child. Um, proactive reminders. We've talked a bit about this um, with our pictures and talked a little bit about being proactive. I think it's really, really <coughs> important, and we can't overstate it enough. The more we can understand a child, understand what, what's going on for a child, the more we can be proactive. Let's put the reminders and the supports in place before we have problems. If we can remind them to put a coat on, we don't worry about them getting frostbite. We can prevent that problem. If we remind them to get their agenda out, or we have a reminder there and they get their agenda to school, then they've got it there and they're not getting into trouble. Great. It's one less thing they're getting in trouble in. That's one more success we can add to their day. Why make it something? A lot of times we think, well, you should be independent on this. You should be able to do it on your own. Well, if you can't, you can't. Why make it a fight if we don't need to? Let's make it a point of success. Let's just support it. And we have to be really careful, I think, when we're doing that, how we phrase the supports. Yes. It needs to be more of a, you know, your agenda's on the table, put it in your bag, rather than don't forget this or why didn't you do that. Absolutely. You know, which is really easy to fall into, especially when you've got four kids all going out the door in the morning that need different interventions, or a classroom with three or four special needs students in it. You know, it's really easy to go to the don't forget, don't, don't, don't. Well, we need to do the do. Flip it over and make We're it We're promoting the do. positive behavior. We're not just reflecting <coughs> on the negative. So as much as we can do that, it's like we're framing it in a positive light. We're framing it in a do. We're framing it in what's the positive. And that's what makes it a support, and that's what makes it proactive as opposed to the don't forget this again. Right? That's the negative, and that leaves them just kind of that discouraged. And there's subtle differences, but they're big. They're big differences. Well, then you can also, you can also set up a system once you know mm -hmm. your students. Of, like, I use hand signals a lot with my own children. Mm -hmm. like, Absolutely. One of my children is extremely loud. Gee, I wonder where she gets that from. That could be the environmental piece. And what do you um, think? I do this, I'm, like turning down the TV, and she just talks quieter. Mm -hmm. Because then I don't have to stop, say, you're really, really loud. Could you please be quiet? Then she's embarrassed in front of everyone else. I just go like this and she's quiet still. Simple, low level intervention, nobody's feelings are hurt, on we go. And you could put reminders, and this is what we're talking about right here, concrete codes to help provide external support. <coughs> concrete codes. You can even put reminders on their desk if you want, that what your code is. And, and I mean, I've worked with teachers, and I've worked with some teachers who have done some great things around this. In fact, they'll sit the child down and say, um, I had one teacher who created sort of a secret agent thing. Okay, you're a secret agent. When I do this, it means this. And, and, they have, and they put little cards on the child's desk that would remind. This means put your bum in your chair. You know? so, so every time she'd go like this, he'd go, oh, yeah. And it was cool, and it was good, and it was a positive reminder. It was kind of fun for him, as opposed to being, you know, get your butt in the chair, and the whole class is looking, going, oh, man. You know that Sam is up out of his chair again. No, just go, hey, Sam. Sam's like, yeah, <laughs> I got that. You know, and, and that's something you can work out with a student. But again, and it's visual, it's concrete, and you know, do what you need if they need a reminder with. But a lot of times it can be, and they can even generate their own code. They can say, this is what would make sense to me. Okay, cool, let's use it. It's easier for them to remember.
Exactly. And another system I use is, is I still have a chalkboard in my room because the school I'm in is a very old school. It's a heritage <laughs> site and we can't change anything, and that's fine. I have students who call out. I'm sure you all have students who call out. Uh, one particular student calls out, I put a tick on the board, and I just keep teaching. Because if I stop the class and I have to address this student, the student's getting the attention they want, but everyone else is not getting what they need. It interrupts me, the kid is one, whatever. Whatever the motive is, I don't know. And I just tick it off. And then when the class is over, I say, okay, I was interrupted this many times. Do you think tomorrow it could be, what, do you think you could get this down to a little less? Yeah. So what's a reasonable number? Mm, if there's 10 there, maybe seven, okay? Let's try it, right? Next day, you can just see them going. You know, they're trying, 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 but there's a visual, concrete reminder. And it's not, a lot of times it's not because they're being rude or malicious, they're just excited. They want to talk and tell you everything mm -hmm. that they know, forgetting that so does everyone else in the room, you know? And I've found this really, really effective. And again, I'm a Div, I'm a Div 2, 3 teacher. I've, I've done this a lot with our, we've got an interesting group of grade four fives this year, <coughs> and it, the call-outs are down to nothing. And they congratulate each other when they've got no, no ticks on the board. It's become kind of a group effort to help whoever it is that's doing the call-outs. And then the kids are happy and they play together. And you know, yeah, it's, become a a really, it's really become a proactive team effort instead of me grinding on some child to please not call out and interrupt me. Mm -hmm awesome and and I mean those are the strategies <coughs> and and the other things is you know there will be days when the call outs will be more and less too and and be prepared for that flexibility and be prepared for not you know okay well we're a little higher today that's all right what are you gonna do tomorrow go forward don't go backwards go forward um, what else do we want to talk about proactive reminders <coughs> we talked about our codes Preparing children for transitions can be really important. A lot of times transitions are really kind of scary. It's like, all right, now what do I have to do? Because I have to be organized. I have to remember what's next. I got to actually execute all this behavior that is difficult. Kids are getting up and moving, which is really distracting. Transitions can be a really challenging time for any of us. Really helping support kids. Some of that could be reminders. Again, you could have a code that kind of reminds them. Transition's coming. Five minutes. Four minutes. You know, things like that. I don't know. Some kids like that. Some kids don't. Some kids hate that. But you can do a little bit of reminders around that. You could have little um, visual reminders again. So you're about to go to math. They're about to switch to math class. You get the little math card and everyone's doing anything. Just you subtly go and just slide into a little thing on their desk. And they know that, oh, math's coming up. Okay. And they can maybe start getting their stuff ready a little bit early. It's okay. You've done it subtly. Nobody knows what's really happened. And they kind of have, you know, there's math. Okay, I know math is coming up next ways like that to kind of remind them and prep them as to what's happening and that can soften a transition. Um, sometimes I've, I've had teachers who they just found that transition period, especially if there's a classroom move, like going to gym or something, was so painful and inevitably they're going to be in a fight with a child in that time, like every time I'm dealing with them going to the office. And so what we did with one child is we had him assigned the special job of blackboard cleaner. So every day at the end of math, before they went to gym, he would clean the blackboard while the rest of the class went ahead to gym, and then the teacher would just walk him down and catch him up at the end. So he'd be like two minutes behind his group because he had to do his job. He had his work to do. You know, he had to help the teacher. And then he'd go and join them. No more problems. He didn't have that hallway time, that kind of open time where they were going down and the shovel and the whatever, and next thing you know, he's in a fight. That's all it took. And he had this special kind of important role that he felt really good about. And it was a logical role. The rest of the kids weren't kind of going, what's that? It's like, no, the board had to be cleaned. Or the whiteboard had to be wiped down. Or the fish had to be fed. Or whatever you've got in your class, or whatever little job you can have, just to give him a couple minutes so the class gets ahead on that transition and he could catch up. The amount of time she saved spending that three minutes doing that as opposed to letting him go with the rest of the group in a day was huge. Real <coughs> savings. That's just kind of a creative way. On the, the next slide, keeping rules consistent and avoiding negotiation. And that consistency, I mean, we've talked a lot about that, I think, already. And I think Marjorie has done a really nice job, too, of illustrating the way the consistency can be really nice between home and school. The more we can do the same things at home and school, the better. It's easier for you. And the more we can be consistent in school. So if you're in a school where there's different classes, different teachers involved, the more you can collaborate with those other teachers to say, this is what I'm doing in my class so that the same thing can be done in each classroom that he's in or she's in. So that it's not like, okay, now I'm in gym and the rules are all different. Now I'm in science and the rules are all different. Now I'm in English and the rules are all different.
keeping the rules the same across these classes. Avoid independent activities as much as possible. I know a lot of times we like to facilitate sort of independence in kids, group work, things like that. This can be a really <laughs> a big challenge for this population, for some of them, depending on who, what their needs are. And so sometimes we want to be a little bit more thoughtful in terms of how we maybe put together groups or facilitate independent work. If we can say either maybe we'll set up the group as opposed to <coughs> letting them choose who goes in what group. So that we're saying, we're going to do independent work, but I'm going to put them in with these really structured people. Because <laughs> I know these guys are structured workers, so that's who I want them working with. Maybe you kind of subtly do a bit more assignment and jobs. Okay, these three are working on this project together. I'm going to make sure this one is in charge of this part of the project, because that's a better fit for him. It's better than doing this piece or this piece. So just having a little bit more hands-on, and I think you can be subtle. The child's still involved in this sort of independent work, but you've had a little bit more hand in controlling the parameters of a little bit more. I think it can be really important. Keeping instructions simple and brief, one step at a time. I think that's kind of a standard piece sometimes, making sure the child's understanding what you're saying. So important. A lot of times, the behavior you're seeing is because the kid has no idea what to do. And, and you guys have seen that before. You guys know that kind of thing. But just to <coughs> emphasize it, and one step at a time can be really important. And sometimes you have to give that one step a few times. And that's OK, too. Keeping it as a, I need you to do this, as opposed to, OK, this is the third time I've told you. Go do this. It's like, no, we want to keep away from the negative. Just be prepared that there may be a lot of prompts needed to get things done and a lot of reminders needed. That's OK. If we're prepared to do it, we're not as annoyed. We're prepared. We're expecting to do it. So we're just going to do it. And we're not going to wait till the child has a problem or the pencils are going into the ceiling because they don't know what to do anymore. No, we're on it. We're going to, every time I drift by their desk, go at this. OK, keep working on this. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. OK. Just little proactive reminder. Oh, keep doing this. Oh, that's right. OK, back, to the t back on task. Um, just a little note I put in here, I guess. Fairness isn't that everyone gets the same, it's that everyone gets their needs met. I know a lot of times it's a challenge as a teacher because you've got a classroom full of people, depending on the mix of your class or the type of program you have, where you feel like, okay, this child is getting so much more of my time than these kids. Is that fair? Is that right? I mean, I, here we are talking about all the things I need to do. Sometimes that's what is fair, because sometimes some kids won't need as much of your time as other children. And so there are times when you may need to devote a bit more time and plan to devote a bit more time to a given child. Don't be caught off guard. Just an, I think you guys already know this kind of stuff. There's certain children you're going to have in your classroom, and they're going to take up more of your time. OK, they're going to take up more of my time. I'm not going to fight it. I'm just going to accept it and say, that's what this child needs to have the same success as a child who doesn't need as much as my time. And that's what FAIR is. Then they have the same opportunity. Saying is not the same as doing. I think we've talked about that one, too, a little bit. You know, this is a population where they could do a beautiful job of telling you exactly what the rules are. These are the rules. When I go to gym class, I need to do this and this and this and this. And you're like, perfect. Oh, Sam, that was great. Sam doesn't even do the first one, let alone all of them. How is it that a child can tell you exactly what they need to do and not do it? Well, it's true. It can happen, and it's legitimate, and it's not necessarily I just didn't <coughs> want to do it. Sam can also probably tell you which all of the other kids who aren't doing it. Oh, <laughs> Sam could report on everybody. Oh, yeah, every single person, but not so much on what part he's missed out or she's missed out. And a lot of time, these are kids who genuinely don't know how to put those things into action. Knowing and doing are two very different things. And even in terms of the brain and the way the brain is wired, knowing things, knowing information, and actually taking that and putting it into practice and functionally doing it are two very, very different systems. They're entirely different things. So just because you can do one does not mean you can do the other. So just because Sam could tell you what he needs to do and what everyone else is not doing and reports in beautifully doesn't mean that he has the <coughs> skills to change his behavior to align with those rules. And he may need you to take him through one step and the next step and the next step to do them. He may need you right there, even though he can say it doesn't mean he can do it, or she can do it, OK? And so really kind of fine-tuning that, and knowing that that child, that's the case for a given child. Monitor and adjust as you go. Trial and error is huge with this population. Sometimes you're going to try something 
Sometimes, you know, I have these brilliant ideas. I think I'm just a genius. And I call the teacher and I say, oh, have I got a great idea for you. They try it. Two days later, they say, yeah, that was a terrible idea, Jackie. It totally, just totally failed. OK, that happens. And you guys are going to have brilliant ideas, and you're going to try them, and they might fail. Read the child. If the child's behavior is getting worse or not getting any better, it's not working. Give it a few days, because <laughs> this is a population that's going to take some time. But we'll know if approaches are working, because these kids will respond when it does work. And you know that if you've seen, you know, when, when children respond well, you know you've kind of hit the right responses, the right, the right match for that child. So don't be afraid to kind of monitor and play it around and tweak with it until you find the right fit. Seeking out positive, I'm into the next one in the classroom, positive privileges opportunity. This is kind of like our blackboard cleaning guy. Finding positive opportunities for these kids to contribute. A lot of times children with FASD, because of their behavior, because the, there may be some challenges, they're quickly characterized as the difficult children, the bad children, the children are in trouble, the children who know the way to the office just like that. The more we can change that characterization, as much for the children as for ourselves, the more we can help this child define themselves as somebody who can have a positive contribution, who can do something well, who can hear, hey, good job, way to go, Chris, that was fantastic. The more they hear that, the more they want to hear it. And the more they'll know how, and the more we support them, the more they'll work to that. It's like the, the marks on the board that Marjorie was talking about. The more they know what they can need to do, and the more there's that positive sort of <coughs> goal, the better off we are. Um, sometimes, you know, are there little things that they can do to help out? Like I said, cleaning the boards or whatever we do now, cleaning the whiteboards, switching the PowerPoint, turning off the smart board. I don't know, you guys use more technology in classrooms. I don't even know what is used. But the more we can find jobs and things and be proactive and say, hey, can you help me out with this? Kids like that. Even older kids like that. Even older kids like that, believe it or not. If you can find opportunities, I worked with one school, it was a, a rural school, and so they had a child with FASD and they were having a lot of difficulty. He was in, I think, grade nine, and although it was sort of a K to not, uh, 12 school, it was a small school, and they were having great difficulty getting him to come to school, getting him to be a part of it. And so what we did is we sort of built in some of his classes into a bit of a work experience. They didn't have a lot of work experience options out there. It was a rural school, few options, but they had a custodian <coughs> who was fabulous and said, you know what, I don't mind if he helps me out with a few things. And so the custodian would supervise, take him around and do some stuff. I mean, it's one child and it's one support, but it was a great thing that the school did. And all of a sudden they had this kid who was running all over the community, getting into lots of trouble, going to school. Because, well, you know, he's, they're counting on him. <laughs> he has things to do now. He was quite proud of that. It was really exciting and it was neat. And everybody was happy because it was a lot less work for a lot of other people. And he was really proud of it. Really. <laughs> And, it was, and so those are some neat things, and there are different things, and, and, and I think we can be creative in the schools and say, what can we find? Are there opportunities for success where this child can define themselves by their success and by what makes them excited, not just by their failure? And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be huge. No, it, I mean, you that know, was a big one, but I mean, it can be just a small thing. Uh, for, for our youngest daughter, she brings me coffee in beds on Saturday mornings and uh, is just really, really proud of the fact that she does that, even though I pretty much have to clean the carpet every time she walks up the stairs, but that's minor. And then one day I was, uh, at camp come to, came down early and her sister was making my coffee and she was quite upset. That's my job. I do a much better job of making coffee than you do because she's really proud of the fact that I make such a big deal. Out of, I mean, nobody else brings me coffee in bed, but she doesn't need to know that. And, and she's really, really proud of that. You know, like cleaning the board might not be a big deal to us, but it's a big deal to these kids. Yeah. Yeah, giving, I mean, finding a positive for a child who hasn't felt a lot of positives, it's, it's big. I mean, how good do we feel? I mean, even think, you know, sometimes you're driving down the road, you ever find you're driving and you're a little annoyed and everyone's cutting you off and you're in that lovely driving mood. And then somebody goes past you and just kind of waves or smiles at you. I remember one day I was sitting in a traffic light and I look over and there's somebody sitting next to you. They kind of smiled at me. I'm like, oh yeah, I feel bad. I don't know. Little positives, little tiny positives can shift our whole frame of reference. Kids are no different. Finding little opportunities can make a big difference for these kids. Um, positive. Communication level, matching a child's communication level. We've talked, I think, a little bit to this. Making sure our language fits with them. Allowing for processing time. A lot of kids who have language problems, they're going to take a long time. They're going to need smaller phrases. So I say kind of match, because sometimes you'll say, I don't know what their language functioning is. 
match to what they're doing. If they kind of use short little phrases, you use short little phrases. Try to listen to their sentences. If their sentences are really gobbledygook, <coughs> a lot of times kids will use really big words. And you, if you listen really carefully, you're like, okay, that sentence didn't actually make sense. I mean, I got the gist, but it didn't make sense. That gives you a good clue that their language level is not really there. That means you need to shorten it up. So kind of be tuned into that, tuned into what's going on for language. Because I've, I've seen some kids whose language is so weak, and yet they talk, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk, and they use all these words, and wow, they sound like they can really do it. And then you listen carefully to actually what they're saying, and you're going, yeah, no, you know what? I don't think they can do it. This is a lot of words, but they're not put together well. And so monitoring that, managing that. <coughs> um, and, there's also, and sometimes you get gaps in expressive and receptive language as well, where you know, I have one child who understands almost everything you tell her but cannot express herself. Mm -hmm. And so people who don't know that tend to talk to her in little short phrases and she gets quite offended because she knows exactly what you're saying. She just can't answer. <coughs> yes, which is where knowing the child is very important. And similarly, you'll get other kids who actually talk beautifully and fluently and lovely, but don't understand. Don't understand. And so the, way, the level you speak at and the level you understand at are two different systems again. And yes, we need to, and again, the more information we have around that, the better. And if you don't have the information, well, you might have to do a bit of trial and error and gauge. If you go to really short words and the child gets offended, you're like, okay, they didn't need that. Time to bump it up a little bit. Play it by ear. Be flexible. Um, things like labeling belongings <coughs> could be important. Sometimes kids with FASD pick up stuff that's not theirs or there's some confusion around who owns what. Um, the clearer their property is labeled, <laughs> you're just laughing. Yeah, you're like, yeah, they sure do. The clearer property is labeled, the easier it makes them to identify it as their own. Okay? The more identifiable it is, that sort of can help. Snack breaks can help. These are kids who don't always know their bodies well. We talked about hot, cold. Same, you know, making sure there's a little bit of snack break can go a long way. I just wanted to add with um, the picking things up that a lot of these kids if it's there and nobody's standing right beside it, it's just, it doesn't belong to anybody. Yeah. Um, so they really don't get that. And it's not about stealing, it's just nobody's there with it, so it's nobody's. It's a very important distinction. What she's saying is, for those who can't, aren't in our room, is that sometimes kids with FASD will see something on a table and it's, nobody else is holding on to it or looks like they own it, so they think, oh, okay, I can just take that. I don't know. So it's not stealing so much as not necessarily understanding the boundaries between what I own and what I don't. So if I know only if it has a big red dot with my name on it on it, do I pick it up? Only red dots. It's on my desk, this big red dot. My desk, my stuff, only red, I'm the red dot person. <coughs> don't touch it. That sometimes helps with that boundary because you're right. It's easy for us to think, oh, this thief, stealing. And again, we it's easy to jump to that. And sure, the kids do because the ki other kids in the class can get really frustrated with that too. Yes, lots of people can get very frustrated. And so really redefining that as poor boundaries or difficulty knowing belonging is important distinction. And further to that, um, I mean, that again varies depending on the child. Mm -hmm. Our youngest child believes that everything in our home is hers. Everything, including my money <laughs> and her father's money. She never touches <coughs> anything in stores, in school, in other people's homes, has never touched anything, and she's 10. But anything in our house, including, including her 18-year-old sister's computer, iPod, cell phone, is hers. So that's a bit of a twist, and it's, I find it's very, very dependent on the, chi on, what the, on the child. Again, know the child, but be prepared to kind of ask more questions. It's like, why is that child doing that? And then try things, okay? We're gonna make them the red dot child. Everything you own and try that. If it works, good, you've solved that problem. If it doesn't, back to the drawing board, gotta figure out something else. And that's all right to do. So the next few slides just sort of look at some specific areas. I'm not gonna speak as long to these. I'll go through them fairly quickly because we're kind of coming up on our time as well. Um, there's a few suggestions around attention. This is nothing new. You guys know this stuff. And I didn't go into this a whole lot because I think you guys could probably teach me attention strategies. That's where I learn anything I've known about how to manage attention. But it's coming back to trial and error. Putting a child at the desk at the front of the classroom can help with attention or not. 
Some kids at the front of the classroom, particularly if we're dealing with an RAD child or a child with other anxiety issues, is horrific. Like it's horrible. They're like looking around. They're looking around. They can't stand the fact that kids are behind them. That can be the worst thing you can do for them. So depending on the unique needs of a child, putting them at the front may or may not work. Putting them by your desk may or may where do I put this child? You may need to ask some questions and think about that in the context of knowing a child. So some of those little strategies or little things that we may or may not do, we may need to evaluate for goodness of fit with a given child. You know, fidget balls, FM systems can be great sometimes, sometimes not. Um, sometimes they really annoy the kids, depending on what the system is like. Medication may or may not be used with a child. That's another time when you want to work closely with family and collaborators, uh, collaborators as to well, how well a given medication may or may not be working for a child. If there's bumps and ebbs and flow in a day, give it, depending on the kind of medication they're on, uh, if it's you know, the long-acting type versus not, um, you're going to see different behavior during the day. Um, concrete token strategies. Marjorie's already kind of spoken to this. Again, if you use those kind of concrete strategies, <coughs> it's great if you can overlap them with what's going on at home. Those strategies can be tough for these kids to get. Some really like them. Some it's too much. Some it's too much for them to remember that cause and effect piece. But some really like it, particularly if it's quite concrete and, and quite visible to them. There's, there's also uh, a, something new I discovered this year. Um, okay. It's a a seat and it's well for the small kids it's about the size of this piece of paper it's on an angle they're plastic and they have a they start about this thick an angle down and they have raised like dots on the top my principal calls them wiggle seats and I'd never seen them before because again in high school we don't do a lot of wiggle seats but we have several kids who had a lot of trouble sitting still we purchased these seats for them and the behavior changed within about six weeks and they came back with their seats and put them down in the office and said you know, I really don't need this anymore, but I know where it is if I, if I do. It made a huge difference in their ability to pay attention. Apparently, mm -hmm. it has something to do with the pressure points that those yep. on those uh, raised areas. And the angle, yeah. And the angle of the seat, but they were brilliant, and they're not very expensive. Some great simple support. <coughs> uh, in terms of memory, uh, in a nutshell, memory stuff, uh, little things, memory can sometimes be a really confusing area with this population and often an area where we find some difficulties. Well, we, what do we need to know to begin with? What might look like a lie may not be. Sometimes these kids really confuse what the truth is. They don't remember where they learned something and so they kind of string stories together and produce it as the truth and it's sort of this piecemeal of a whole lot of different things. What would you do on the weekend? Oh, well, I had this birthday party, and at the birthday party, oh, this dinosaur came in, and then the dinosaur was there, and we were running, and the cake was, and you're thinking, <laughs> that dinosaur at your birthday party. But, you know, they watched this movie, and the movie had a dinosaur in it, and they were at a birthday party, <laughs> and, but, you know, they kind of put it together because they're not, their memory isn't organized in such a way that allows them to separate those pieces. Sometimes you can sort of say things to them like, okay, well, what, what would your mom tell you, me about this? Well, they tell you there's a lot of cake or something like that. Sometimes you can get to it a little bit more if you ask them the question differently. Other times you can't, and, and you can't get the straight goods. It's important, or my suggestion would be, if it's not really vital, it's about a birthday party, let it go. Let it go. It's all right. We don't need to challenge all these things. It's okay if they're telling you about this. If they believe it for that moment, fine. All right. Sounds good. Um, some teachers and some parents, what I've seen them do is sort of truth or story kind of training and it's sort of like, sort of say, ooh, truth or story and making it a game so that it's not like you're in trouble, you're telling me a lie. It's more like, oh, is that truth or story? And then they think about it a minute and they go, eh, story. And, and they kind of at least acknowledge that having a dinosaur at a birthday party, yeah, maybe not, okay, story. So sometimes for some kids, you can turn it into something like that. <laughs> that can be helpful in helping them to start asking that question themselves too. One of the places that those kind of memory issues can become a real problem for them is socially. Because a lot of their friends are like, oh, you're so full of it. Stop making up these stories. And if the kids are going, it's not a story, there can be some real tension there. And so that's why it's sometimes good for, with us to work with the kids, not against the kids in sort of a you're in trouble way, but more a, hey, let's try to figure out what's truth, what's fact here, what isn't. Um, Little things like, let's avoid asking questions that we already know the answer. If they're holding the pencil in their hand, don't say, did you take the pencil? They took the pencil. We just say, okay, where are we going to go from here? So if we know that they took it, if we know that they did it, if we know that this happened, let's not ask them. 
did you do this? Because if they say no, then we're going to be in an argument, and then we're trying to figure out, and it becomes a control, it becomes a control piece. The more we can ab avoid any kind of battles or any kind of control stuff, because, you know, kids win those. Kids win because they can up the ante further than we can. They always can, really. I mean, and then they lose in the end, right? But as much as we can a a avoid that and just say, let's just not ask those questions. Let's just go straight to, okay, well, when this happens, this is the next step. Boom. Here we go. We're not even going to talk about, did you do this? Um, reminders in every setting, we've talked about that already. Lots of reminders. Memory can be a huge problem for this population. A lot of times, they just honestly are not remembering. Academically, on to the next slide. Again, know your child. I feel like I say that over and over again. Know the child <laughs> in your class. Um, tie in the academic supports to what that child's unique needs are. If you've got some people to work with and you've got an academic assessment or some information, that's going to really help you know how to tailor a little bit. Uh, repeating instructions, we've talked about. More time to do work can sometimes make a big difference. So either more time to do the work or less problems. Give them a little less work. Sometimes you guys know that goes a longer way. Shorter tasks. Um, monitoring them for frustration. Watch for the behavior. Watch for their indicators that it's not working because they are not going to come up to you and say, pardon me, but I'm having some difficulty. They're just going to start snapping the pencil and bugging the guy next to them and telling you that my mom beat me last night. Watch for those things. Those are the clues. Those are the ways they are communicating with you. That's their method of communication. Watch for it and respond. And I'm not going to go <coughs> on a whole lot more about academic because you guys could teach me about that. Uh, tapping areas of interest is the last one I refer to there. Yeah, if they're interested in it, they're going to invest more in it. That's every child out there, and this population is no different. Um, and I'll talk problems that, responding to problems. The next one goes to what happens when we have problems. And I think we've really kind of touched on a lot of these things, so I'm not going to go through them a lot, except to just, re, you know, talking about looking at your goal, know what your goal is with the child. We're trying to improve the function, not solve every problem all at once. Not appearing angry, you guys know that. You get angry, they're going to respond in kind. So we got to stay really calm and we got to keep ourselves as level as we can. Uh, keep things immediate, try to be consistent. If we're doing timeouts or things like that, we want it to be consistent. Same place as much as we can. We may find that natural logical consequences won't always work because if there's cause and effect difficulties, if I don't get if then, then logical consequences are not going to make any sense to me. That will not make any sense to me. Just the same consequence every time might make more sense to me because I know if this, then always this. That I can do, not if this in this situation, and then if this in that situation, and then it changes to this. Wow, that's a lot. So logical consequences won't necessarily make sense. So we want to just have general, consistent consequences. And sometimes when you ask a child why they did something, I find avoiding why questions with this population fairly essential. If you ask, why did you do this, the standard answer I get is, I don't know. And oftentimes, they don't know. They really don't know. It's a it's genuine impulse. answer. It's impulse, it's like, there it was, it's a shiny thing, I had to have it. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no malice, there was no forethought, there was no calculation, I just had to have it. It just went. So I find avoiding why questions with this population really important. Which takes us to the next page. Say having a safe place <coughs> for kids, because they will, when there are outbursts, we want to know, we need a plan. Be prepared for problems, there will be. No matter how hard we work and how proactive we are, there will be the days where a problem arises. Know what that problem behavior will be with that child, what do you typically or what might happen, and then create safety around that, a safe place for them to come down, a safe place to deal with it. And that may be working with your school or figuring out in your classroom what that might look like. Uh, limiting language, again, depending on the unique needs of your child. You may need to sometimes when a child does something wrong, we feel inclined to go blah, 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 blah. <laughs> My kids tell me, you know, stop doing that. Limiting language. This, there, done. I've said all I need to say. Pen, nope. Corner, I don't know, I'm making that up. But keeping the language as small as we can and providing those consequences. This was wrong, now this. Done. We don't need to elaborate. I don't need to lecture you about that with somebody else's. Now they're sad. That wasn't a good idea. Don't take things that don't belong. No. Took it, you know, give it back. Whatever that consequence is going to be. The bottom line. Children with FASD can experience success. If there's anything you leave with today, I'd love you to leave with that. 
children with FASD can and do experience success. You guys are a big part of making that happen. Finding the right fit for a child can lead to success. And th these kids have tremendous potential and they have a lot to offer. We just need to work to find the right fit for them. They will often require unique and well-matched supports to achieve the success, and that's all right. You're not alone. Working with a child with FASD can be incredibly difficult and very frustrating. You're not alone. You have a caregiver, you have other professionals, you have other teachers. Reach out to these people, create a network that is really functional and that works for you and works for this child, and then pass that network along. The more that we collaborate, the more that we share, the better we're going to get as a team working with this population, and the more we're going to be able to support them without getting burnt out ourselves. The right fit may take time and patience. We may have to try a few things. That's okay. Let's be prepared to do that. If we go in knowing that, it's not going to be as frustrating when it happens, because we know, okay? So we'll take some time. Finally, remain hopeful. That's right back to our success piece. Don't give up on these kids. Sometimes it's going to take a long time to find that fit. Don't give up on these kids. They've got a lot to offer. We can do that. And you see my email up here again, and, and, and Marjorie's, and if you are looking for team members, and if you're saying, I got nobody to talk to, then you can always send us an email. <coughs> I think we're both really receptive to emails, um, questions that don't get asked today or there's not time for today. Email them. I'm happy to see emails. I love the opportunity to talk to people. I think that's the best way we exchange ideas and, and can continue developing. And I think that's more than enough for me. Anything, any, I've got a couple minutes left. Any questions from this room? Okay. Um, I went to the last symposium, and then there was a longitude study done, and they had shown some plateauing of this population in certain areas of comprehension, and they showed their sexuality and expressive language. And I was just wondering uh, what your experiences in the school system, especially with middle middle school and high school in regards to switching the strategies to be at what age are you seeing that you're focusing more on life skills? That's a great question. I think again it's going to vary for the child a little bit. I think junior high is when, I mean there are some kids I think we start making the switches <coughs> early as like grade, there's been kids in grade five, six that we're already starting to make some shifts with. Junior high is a point where I often am participating in making those shifts, certainly by high school that's happening. Yes, absolutely. I would say, I would expect high school would probably, if it's going to be, it's the primary focus by then. But a lot of kids, it's through junior high. And in fact, a lot of times I'm trying to push it earlier. My risk is that we always wait too long before making that shift. I don't want to lose kids. I'm worried that if we wait too long before we shift to vocational strategy or you know, basic you know, living kind of things as you're talking about, uh, or applied kind of strategies that will lose the kids. They'll just stop showing up. They're going to give up on school. So we kind of have to find that sweet spot where we're supporting them as best we can educationally, but also keeping them in school or allowing them to you know, get, develop those uh, skills that they need. So I think junior high is, is a pretty important point of time. And just coming from school, do you find moving them in, if they're in a mainstream setting, um, whether or not what your opinion is on segregation uh, in regards to getting on <laughs> I, I was going to say she would ask the hard question. Because they have it all over in the United States and they have it in some programs here for autistic children. And so what your opinion was on that in regards to meeting their maximum potential? I, uh, now this is my opinion and I am the parent of four FASD children. Um, I have one child in a segregated program because her behaviors are so extreme that the other kids and herself and the teacher are at risk in a regular program. At that point, she needs to be segregated because she's going to hurt somebody. I am hoping that with the right kind of intervention, she will be integrated back into the mainstream at some point because she's going to live in mainstream society when she gets to be 18, whatever that means for her. She's still going to have to interact with other people that she doesn't see every day in a segregated setting. My other three kids are in uh, inclusive schooling and have done the oldest one just graduated from high school with an advanced diploma and we were told initially that she would never learn to read she did math 30 pure all by herself we were so proud of her uh, in an inclusive setting however there were modifications to her program 15 kids in a class and some some boards provide for that 
I'm also a teacher and I do a lot of teaching at home. The second child is in an AP program and doing brilliantly and doesn't need a lot of intervention. The third child is a straight A student in a regular grade six class in a regular school. So it has a lot to do with what each child needs and how their presence affects them and the other kids in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's how we've made our decision. It's a parent's right to include a child. Inclusion is the front line in this province. And in my opinion, that's the way it should be, unless there's extreme circumstances, such as there is in our youngest child's case. Any other questions? I want to ask a question on behalf of the parents. I <laughs> want your wisdom. I'm here. good with that. <laughs> um, I have three siblings all different levels of FAS and ages, so the interaction between each other is where my problem is. Not so much because they can't think on the same level as myself and my husband. And that's where I find probably most of my conflict. Because my oldest, which you would think would be the easiest, is the most difficult. And I can't treat him like a 13-year-old because he doesn't act like a 13-year-old. So then I have the problems where you think he's supposed to be a role model in some ways as the other kids look up to him, but he's not a role model because it's the most problem within my house. And so that presents a real dilemma for you. It does. I think one of the things I hear you say is that society and parents have expectations of children who are depending on their birth order in houses. Uh, we have the same kind of thing at our house, and I've had to shove a lot of that aside. Parenting these kids has really challenged my um, previous idea of what parents do. My oldest daughter has some things that are not really good role modeling for her younger sisters, but she also has some things that are really good. So we talk a lot about how do you get by in life? What helps you get by in life? Does this help you get by? No. Okay, then what is this? Yes, it does. And we try to really look at the positive things, and then I work with her because I'm the parent on some of the things that she really needs to work on, like managing money is a huge thing for her. I mean, she's 18 years old. You know, she'd spend every cent she had if I didn't take it out of her bank account every time she got paid and put it in another account, right? So that's very poor role modeling for her siblings. But we, I really try hard to emphasize the good things that she does and the intera good the interactions that she has with the kids. There's, I don't really, I haven't found a solution. I think it's kind of an ongoing process and it's very in the moment. Is there times when you find you have to keep them apart? Oh yes. So then I'm not... Oh no, <laughs> no, there are times when we have to keep them apart. In fact, one of my, our children has moved out of the house because we had to keep them far apart. Yeah. Um, Again, it really challenges our idea of family and our role as caregivers. And it really helps to find out that this happens in other families too. Sometimes, you know, they're all at different levels and, you know, I've got one child who's extremely violent and three that aren't. They have three that are at risk. The one child had to move out. That doesn't mean I'm not going to parent her anymore. It just means I'm going to parent her differently. Does that help? Yep. Jackie and Marjorie, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. I always enjoy seeing you, Jackie, and it's nice meeting you, Marjorie, and you're coming back. Um, through this presentation, we now have a deeper understanding, I believe, of the challenges and how to build success uh, in our work with our kids with FASD in the classroom, as well as really some practical strategies <coughs> to support these children and really recognizing the importance of linking with the caregivers and developing a community of practice or a community support system. So again, thank you very much ladies, much appreciated. Please fill out your evaluation forms um, and ensure that you've signed in and have a great evening. Thank you.